Anime is an art form that explores some of society's most thought-provoking and philosophical questions. Do humans truly have free will? What is justice, and who has the right to enforce it? Is a utopia possible, and what would be the cost? Wouldn't it be cool if you could buy teenage cat girls to be your slaves? FBI, open up! It's the year of our lord 2023, and Truck-Coon has claimed the lives of countless Japanese teenage boys and yeeted them into medieval fantasy worlds. Worlds filled with dazzling magic, mystical creatures, and for some reason, slavery. Slavery has become an increasingly common trope in isekai, but why is it so prevalent? What are these shows trying to say about slavery? To figure this out, I'll have to do some isekai research. Wait. No, no, that can't be right. That can't be right. Oh, no, I get it. He's gonna free all the slaves. He's gonna free them, right? She'll do. I'll take this one. Oh my god. Today, I'm putting isekai anime on trial for how it represents slavery. I might not have a law degree, but I have seen Legally Blonde, and I have played Ace Attorney, so I'm pretty sure I've got this in the bag. Ladies, gentlemen, and degenerates of the jury, today I shall present you with irrefutable evidence that slavery is sullying the sacred genre of isekai. Court is now in session. As a heads up, I will be discussing some mature themes in this video, including brief references to sexual assault. I'll also be spoiling the plots of some isekai, so proceed at your own risk. The idea of an isekai story featuring slavery was originally something that took off in light novels instead of on screen. However, after the light novel Rising of the Shield Hero received an anime adaptation in 2019, the trend took off. Because Shield Hero was a commercial success, similar isekai light novels also received anime adaptations, and thus the trope was born. So here's a quick rundown. Now Fumi, our hero, is a modern-day Japanese guy who's summoned to another world, along with Great Value Kirito, Dollar Store Link, and Ponytail Bro. Everyone thinks Nafumi is lame because shields are boring. Then he's falsely accused of rape by a princess. Everyone hates his guts and he gets kicked out of the palace. He still has to train to fight monsters, but no one will help him because his reputation sucks. So he buys the cheapest slave his broke ass can find, a demi-human girl named Raftalia. She has a magical branding on her chest, which forces her to obey Nafumi's orders. Nafumi enlists his new slave to help him level up by killing monsters. Raftali is terrified because she has PTSD from that one time when monsters killed her entire family, but Nafumi uses her slave brand to force her to fight against her will. Her PTSD is miraculously cured after one fight, and soon she and Nafumi are best buds, even though she's still technically his property. The other heroes are pretty weirded out that Nafumi owns a slave. He actually has a slave in his party? Man, how much lower is this guy gonna go? Then Ponytail Guy challenges Naofumi to a duel, with the understanding that if he wins, Naofumi will have to free Raftalia. They fight, Naofumi almost wins, but the princess cheats, and Raftalia is freed. Hooray! But then five minutes later, she decides that actually she really wants to be a slave again, and she asks to be rebranded so that she can become Naofumi's slave, and they'll be together forever. The end. Well, that actually wasn't the end, it was only like five episodes, but I had to stop watching at this point because I could feel myself developing an ulcer. There was definitely some initial backlash online when the show first started airing, but ultimately it performed pretty well, it was rated highly, and it's been greenlit for not only a season two, but now a season three. But enough about Rising of the Shield Hero. Let's see what came after. More and more isekai began following in the footsteps of Shield Hero and incorporating slavery into their stories. But where Shield Hero didn't imply any romantic relationship between Naofumi and Raftalia, future isekai did not hold themselves to the same standard. And pretty soon, isekai protagonists began collecting hot slave babes left and right like Pokemon to add to their harems. The more research I did for this video, the more these shows started to blur together, and I realized that they follow a pretty set formula. First, they always feature a male protagonist, usually a young adult or teenager, who is somehow transported into a fantasy world where slavery exists. The protagonist is in need of a new adventuring party member, or a new hot babe for his harem, so he ends up deciding to buy a slave. The slave is always a young, conventionally attractive girl or woman. 
Now, to make sure our audience knows that our hero isn't a bad person for buying a slave, the protagonist will agonize over this decision, via a long-winded internal monologue about how he knows slavery is wrong, but he has no choice, and of course he's going to be a good slave owner because he'll treat his slave so much better than some other creep. After all, he's a good guy. Needless to say, things escalated pretty quickly, and we went from hero buys a slave to round out his party to hero decides to invest in full-blown sexual slavery. No, 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 wait, 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 Okay, but what about the good ones? You know, the isekai where the hero helps the slaves out instead of buying them. Let's take a look at some contenders. First, Jobless Reincarnation, in which the protagonist actually helps rescue some beast children who are being abducted by slave traders. This seems pretty wholesome. Until you remember that a few episodes ago, he was living with a wealthy family and being waited on hand and foot by enslaved beast people working as servants. Not only that, but the family's patriarch straight up has a fetish for beast people, and he is cheating on his wife and having sex with his beast people servants. This behavior is neither opposed nor ethically examined by the protagonist. Okay, so I guess we can cross that one off the list of good ones. What about Skeleton Knight in Another World? Apparently most of the plot centers on the hero trying to put an end to slavery. That should be pretty good. Let's give the first episode a try. <laughs> This show is supposed to be like an adventure romp comedy, and yet it opens with one of the most graphic, upsetting rape scenes I've ever seen in anime, period. I did give it a couple more episodes, and it did go deeper into the protagonist's journey of trying to put an end to the slave trade, but honestly, the opening was so upsetting, and the show's attitude towards sexual assault and mistreatment of women in general was just so... Ugh, icky that I could not possibly recommend the show to anyone. Another isekai called How a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom also has a plotline about the protagonist wanting to abolish slavery. This show makes some interesting points about the more realistic barriers there are to abolishing slavery. For example, the hero, Soma, has to consider the economic and political implications of ending the slave trade. Soma really emphasizes how he sees slavery as a violation of human rights and a total abomination, but he can't end it outright because he fears that he'll be putting the country on the brink of civil war if he does anything too drastic. Now, this seems really noble of him, until you remember that one time three episodes ago when he defeats an enemy of his and literally turns her into his slave as a punishment. There's also this weirdly out of place scene where the same woman who was just turned into a slave is talking about how she was whipped as a punishment, but it's played off as some kind of joke. That woman, she whipped me like with a real whip. It didn't leave a mark on me though the lashes burned my skin like fire. The whip is love and love must be accepted. <laughs> Okay, so we're 0 for 3. So we've established that Isekai has a bad habit of trying to turn the hero into a sympathetic slave owner, and even in Isekai where the hero is opposed to slavery, the subject matter isn't always handled with nuance. I think it's about time to stop presenting evidence and start wrapping up this trial. And now, ladies, gentlemen, and degenerates of the jury, it's time for me to make my closing argument and address the final and most important question of all. Who cares if there's slavery in Isekai? Sure, slavery is morally wrong, and a human rights violation, and misogynistic, and honestly pretty cringe, but at the end of the day, anime is fiction. It deals with a ton of potentially problematic or morally gray topics. It has violence and murder and brothers obsessed with their sisters and sisters obsessed with their brothers and whatever the heck this is, and worst of all, hand-holding. So why make a big stink about slavery? If I don't want to watch that one time I got reincarnated as a slave trader in another world, 
It's not like I'm being duct taped to a chair and forced to watch it. Nothing's stopping me from turning it off and watching Pingu for the 432nd time. God, that penguin is wise beyond his years. But the way slavery is handled in isekai is a symptom of a greater issue. And that issue is that the isekai genre has become oversaturated with generic, self-insert power fantasies made to sell as much manga or as many light novels as possible. And because Shield Hero and other shows with slaves had some success, including slavery, became a part of the isekai formula. Consider the recently airing isekai In Another World with My Smartphone, a show so unbearably mid that the entire anime community, both Tumblr SJWs and 4chan degenerates alike, came together in solidarity to collectively agree that it is a shameless, soulless cash grab created for the sole purpose of pandering to the largest possible audience to make as much money as it can. Anime, just like many other industries, needs money to survive. But lately, it seems like we're lurching closer and closer to creative bankruptcy as anime studios crank out more painfully mediocre isekai harems to sell body pillows and light novels and increase their profit margins. For every gem with a unique art style, interesting premise, and compelling story, there are 10 cliche isekai harems. I know I'm not the only one who has preached this hot take, but I'd rather add my voice to the choir than sit back and watch generic isekai clone itself until my entire Crunchyroll suggestion page is filled with variations of the same show repeated over and over again. Okay, so maybe none of the arguments I made today would actually hold up in a court of law but I've done my best to present my case, and it's up to each member of the jury to decide whether they think slavery has a place in isekai. And by jury, I mean anime viewers and consumers everywhere. Anime studios keep making generic slave-owning isekai because so far, that has been what helped them turn a profit. But there are shows out there that do it better. Anime like Vinland Saga, a critically acclaimed show about Vikings, which spent basically its entire second season showing the dehumanizing and horrific cost of slavery. There's also the 1999 anime Now and Then, Here and There, a haunting dystopian nightmare about child soldiers, which emphasizes the repercussions of war and is not for the faint of heart. Or there's a film credited as one of the greatest animated movies of all time due to its impressive voice cast, amazing animation, characters, cinematography, and a wonderful musical score. A film that just encapsulates everything that- Prince of Egypt doesn't count as an anime. But it's too- No, it's not an anime. It's a 1998 DreamWorks movie. I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. 